Hello, my name is Pierre De Fourny from the University of Louvain in Belgium. And it is my pleasure to introduce the Senforstat open source toolbox for large scale crop mapping. This is the third part of a training entitled Mapping Crops and Their Biophysical Characteristics with Polarimetric SAR and Optical Remote Sensing. This third part will be followed by a fourth training session, which allow you to be introduced to crop-specific time series analysis for growth monitoring. This fourth session will take advantage of the lesson learned today. The today session is organized in four sections. First, we will identify and understand the key challenges for large-scale crop mapping using high spatial resolution data. The section two will introduce the send for stat toolbox solution for large-scale crop mapping. Section three will show how to use practically the send for task toolbox for crop mapping. We will complete with section four by a question and answer session. But first, let me introduce why today we can consider mapping very large area of agricultural land and even monitoring the crop development along the season in near real time at 10 meter resolution for any large country. The main reason which make this feasible are displayed here. New satellite missions and IT revolutions have completely changed the game of agriculture application using satellite observation. Indeed, following the Landsat decades of observation, the European Copernicus program launched a set of satellites which make a big difference. Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 are providing today for any part of the world a systematic coverage which is free, open and available on the long term. This data policy allows today to develop fully operational solutions in agriculture application. Radarsat constellation mission, new space constellation like the one from planets, make sure that we have complementary information to these major missions, which are Landsat and Sentinel missions. The second reason why the game is changing is the availability of cloud computing infrastructure. These server farms allow today to store the full Earth observation data archive and to make it available to all at a low cost, allowing the exploitation at low or reduced cost. A third reason is related to the smartphone equipped by GPS. This application running on smartphone are turning anybody, any person in the world in a data collection people. This allow to collect ground observation all over the, the area in a very wide way, combined sometimes with UAV, which allow to have also a large sampling of observation. These ground observation are essential for agriculture application. 
a fourth reason is the better organization of the international community, for instance, through the CEOs, through the GCAM network, which allow in the context of GeoGlam to develop joint experiments for crop assessment across different sites in the world, or similarly, the ACMIP community allowing to share experience around agromet models. A fifth reason is the development of a set of open to open source toolbox very much dedicated to agriculture application, which make use of the big data available today. These open source applications allow to address the challenge of big data. All together, these reasons can make us able to say that this is operational to derive a set of agriculture products from Earth observation, like crop mapping, crop type mapping, biophysical variables, estimation, crop condition monitoring, or even agricultural practice monitoring. This, unlike previously, can be done not only at landscape level, but at field level, and even sometimes at intra-field level. Therefore, the question today is as follows. How can we take advantage of the Copernicus Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 data for crop mapping in an operational manner at national scale? Before going into this question, let's have a look at the Sentinel-2 mission. As you know, there are two satellites orbiting around our planet. Each satellite have an orbit with a path of Y swap of 290 kilometers. And you will need several passes to cover a given country. And it may take up to five days if there is any cloud to have a wall-to-wall -wall coverage of a given country. But of course, unlike on this planet, more than 50% of the area is covered by cloud, which make much longer the period to cover a given country only once. Let's start with the section one. Challenges for large-scale crop mapping at high spatial resolution. This is very different than all the MODIS or spot vegetation application, which, was, which were daily coverage with a very wide swap allowing to cover on a daily manner any country. Today, the high resolution satellite imagery provides a set of challenges that we need to address. These challenges are in addition to the big data challenge related to the volume of imagery, and also the corresponding IT requirement. On the top of this constraint, three main challenges need to be defined. First, the observing satellite system, as the one we have just seen at high resolution, do not cover large area at once. As we have seen, Sentinel-2 instrument swap is 290 kilometers. Sentinel-1 interferometric wide swap mode cover only 250 kilometers per orbit. And in addition to that, there is an overlap between images acquired from adjacent orbits. Finally, there is an increasing overlap between adjacent orbit due to converging orbit to the North Pole. This effect is very well illustrated on the picture on the right side, where we can see the coverage of Sentinel-1 over Europe. While 
the revisit cycle is at the equator uh, 12 days for a given satellite. With two satellites, we will have six days at the equator, but within three months, from July to September, we will have 47 observations at the latitude of Spain. When we move northwards, we can reach up to 105 observations for the same period, thanks to the overlapping orbit uh, due to the converging uh, path. This geometrical feature define the heterogeneity of observation density across the area. The second challenge is related to the cloud coverage frequency, which is, as you know, quite variable and will limit the valid observation recorded by optical system. In addition, the non-systematic acquisition plan of SAR system and some optical system will introduce some variability in terms of coverage over space and time, meaning that combining all, we will have a large heterogeneity of valid observation density across the area, partly due to the geometrical effect, secondly due to the cloud coverage and the non-systematic acquisition plan. The third main challenge is related to the ground surface. Indeed, over a large area, we can observe significant agroclimatic gradient, meaning that the rainfall will vary from one area to another, the temperature will vary from one area to another, introducing large variability in crop development, in crop calendar, and even in land cover development. This will lead to a very large diversity for a given crop type, for instance. Within the same country, we may have a, a, a given crop type, which is at the emergence, while on the other side of the country, we are close to the harvest. There is no way we can combine these two signatures in a given crop type. Let's look more detail through an example. But what is so special with large scale crop mapping? We just mentioned the three challenges already identified. But for crop mapping, what is also very special is the role of the temporal resolution, which is very critical for crop discrimination. Indeed, the crop are all vegetated material and the timing of their development will make the difference between crops. And therefore, the temporal resolution is a critical feature for a good crop mapping. Looking at the example of Sudan, we will have a number of granules to cover the entire country. The scenes provided by Landsat will split the country into the blue square, while the tile provided to Sentinel will correspond to the red square or the red rectangle. We will have many orbit, many dates of observation to be combined to get a wall-to-wall -wall coverage. But let's look first at the number of valid image, meaning that an image need to have a cloud cover less than 10% to be valid. When we consider the period from March 2017 to February 2018, 12 months. As you can see, for some area in Sudan, the reddish area, we are close to 10 observations only for 12 months. While when we look at the red, the green area, we will have up to 70 observations for 
the same year. This corresponds clearly to the overlapping area of the sentinel orbit. The heterogeneity of the sentinel observation and the heterogeneity of the Landsat 8 observation that you can see below will make very diff difficult the use of these time series as they are. Therefore, a first solution to cope with this heterogeneous valid observation density is to proceed through monthly synthesis. This means that we will combine all the cloud-free reflectances acquired over a given month, and we average them to provide a single image for this month. Each band will be averaged separately, allowing to consider color composition like this one uh, that you can see on the display. Of course, as you can visualize, there are several artifacts which are due to the variability of the input data, due to the diversity of atmospheric correction and the diversity of the related performances. Most importantly, working with monthly composite will reduce the temporal resolution to a month which is critical for the crop discrimination. Several methods are available to complete this temporal synthesis. Many of them are averaging all cloud-free reflectances acquired during the given period. You can see the benchmarking of different methods on the right side of the slide where we use several averaging methods and more classical mean value composite or maximum value composite approach. The idea is when you have a time series, you have a set of valid pixels as it is illustrated on the left side of the image. And you can run a quality control to figure out which one are the most valid pixels. You, we can use all these quality control valid value of reflectances and average them to assign the mean to the same pixel. By doing so for each pixel, pixel by pixel, spectral band by spectral band, we will build up the synthesis. Of course, there are more sophisticated approaches, like the one selected by Senforstat, which correspond to the weighted average synthesis processor, where in addition of the simple average, we will weight the value according to the distance of the date with regards to the central date of the composite period. We will weight also the value according to the aerosol optic, uh, optical thickness. Similarly, the pixel close to a cloud for a given date will be weighted as they may be more perturbated than the one far from the cloud. Finally, we will give priority to Sentinel-2 with regards to Landsat 8, because of the spatial resolution of these two sensors. Such a sophisticated approach allows to reduce significantly the compositing artifact, providing nice visual product. Still, the monthly temporal resolution is not suitable for crop discrimination. However, in some countries where the cloud-free synthesis are so nice, it could be feasible to use this monthly temporal series for the crop discrimination. We can have a look here. We are in the Western Cape province 
in South Africa with monthly composite for the month of June here, the month of July, the month of August, where the reddish area now correspond to the growing season, going to September with the senescence phase, and then the October starting with the harvest and the November completing the harvest and showing the bare soil. Such a nice type series of monthly composite will probably allow a good crop discrimination. However, in most countries, such a nice time series won't be feasible and will have many artifacts and many missing data even at the monthly timestamp. A similar approach can be used for the microwave domain. Indeed, the solution to the cloud, as you know, is the use of the SAR mission. However, the speckle is very well known, and this is a random component in the SAR signal that can be reduced by averaging all the observations available for a given period. This provides, produce a large noise reduction, as you can see on the left side of the image. Here we see the mean of the coherence value acquired during the month of March 2017 over Netherlands. These are interferometric pairs used for the coherence computation. Such a noise free imagery allowed to be combined with several ones to produce the nice color composite that you have on the right side of the slide. That kind of color composite are also very interesting for crop discrimination, as you can imagine from the visual inspection. Of course, neither for the optical nor for the SAR, the temporal synthesis will solve the critical problem of the temporal resolution needed for the crop discrimination. Therefore, a second solution to cope with the heterogeneous observation density over large area, which is different than the monthly compositing, is implemented in the same for star. This corresponds to the production of an optical time series or of a SAR time series, which will be gap filled using linear interpolation with respect to missing data. Therefore, the missing data due to cloud, to cloud shadows, to no data, to invalid data will be replaced by the gap fill value. This provides a continuous profile over the full time series. Then the continuous profile can be resampled in the time dimension at a regular interval to synchronize all the observation to specific dates. This approach provides the same observation dates over the whole area independently from the sensor orbit and the cloud cover occurrence, which is very critical because this allows to run most of the classification methods. This synchronization is instrumental for large scale mapping applications. Let's come back to our Sudan, South Sudan example. Looking at the country and the meteorological map, we can see a major rainfall gradient across the country. This gradient will, of course, define two different crop calendars. 
on one side, we have a, a one season production area where we have a calendar starting in April with a growing season in June and July, August, and the harvest in September. For the main crop, and then some crop with a long cycle crop will have a, a bit longer growing season. On the other side, where the rainfall are more abundant, we can have a B, grow, B seasonal cropping system. With the first crop starting earlier than the, the other one, with the growing season starting even in May and ending by the harvest in August. And then a second crop growing from October to December. We can understand that we cannot mix the maize from the second crop season in the southern part with the maize of the northern part. There will be a different stages, different stages for a given date. Therefore, the only way to proceed is to stratify the country into different zones. In this case, two zones have been defined according to the agroclimatic gradients and the administrative regions. These two zones are displayed here and will be classified completely separately. Of course, when we proceed by stratification, we will have to calibrate a specific model for each stratum. This will require to collect enough ground observation for each zone, not only for the crop type, but also for all the non-agricultural classes. Indeed, nine land cover class need to be distinguished as well to retrieve and identify specifically the crop type. Therefore, the sampling here was good enough to collect 4,600 samples widely distributed in the country. However, we need to, to split this into two zones corresponding to the stratification, making maybe 2,300 available for each zone. In addition, we will have the nine land cover types which are not non-crop and a dozen of crop type, meaning that we will have 21 classes to calibrate for each stratum. This gives us, in average, 100 samples for each crop type for each stratum. This illustrates why stratification needs to be handled carefully because it multiplies very quickly the number of ground observations needed for the large scale crop type mapping. Let's proceed now with section two to introduce the Senforsta toolbox in order to map large scale area in terms of crop type. Senforstat is an ESA open source toolbox for operational crop type mapping and crop condition monitoring over a very large area. This toolbox is able to process Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2, and Landsat-8 and 9 time series according to a state-of-the-art method, including advanced product. This toolbox can deliver automatically or on request five types of product which are related to processors. They can be delivered in real time along the satellite data acquisition or offline on request. The five types of products are as follows. 
The first one is the 10 meter optical cloud free temporal synthesis, as well as the 10 meter SAR temporal synthesis. The second one is the time series of spectral indices like NDVI, brightness, NDWI, red edge indices, and so on, and the biophysical variable estimation like LAI, F cover, FA bar. A third kind of product are the crop type map at 10 meter resolution which are produced, as I just mentioned, along the season, based on in-situ data set and possibly stratification. The fourth kind of type of product correspond to a large set of crop growth condition metrics, including even meteorological data set. The last but not least type of product are related to crop yield estimation at various aggregation level, either national, regional, or local. These five types of product are fully complementary. They can be combined to each other in order to add value to the information. This open source toolbox may look a bit complex. It is a very large machinery which can run on cloud computing infrastructure or on your local server. The first part on the left side corresponds to the data access or the automated download. The second part refers to the pre-processing step for the different missions considered in this data set, and the in-situ quality control. The third part corresponds to the core area of the toolbox, which delivers the five types of product we just mentioned. The last part on the right side refers to the analytic tools and the visualization uh, of the product. This open source toolbox got a graphical user interface to configure the system and to launch the production or to monitor the processes. The system needs to be configured before the start of the season if you want to run in the real time. Of course, you can also run it offline and therefore you can configure the system whenever you like. A few set of parameters need to be defined in order to launch the production. First, your area of interest need to be delineated as a shape file to be uploaded. Then, for this given area, you need to select the growing season of interest corresponding to the monitoring period. You will have to indicate the start and the end of this monitoring period. You can then select the type of mission you want to use for the monitoring, Sentinel-2, Sentinel-2 and Landsat 8 and 9, or Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2 and Landsat 8 and 9. Any combination is possible, allowing to tune the dataset to the region of interest. Then, the data source has to be defined to get the data automatically or to get access on the cloud infrastructure. Therefore, you can select your own data set where you have your own credential or your own access to data. This can be your local storage on your own server. Of course, this allows to define the overall sets of parameters, but then you will have to 
trigger some action, like the fill data campaign, which rely on a good sampling design that we will mention, possibly including stratification. You will have to go to the field or people will get the data available for you in order to be able to link the crop type on the field and the location of this field. This field data set is very much required for the calibration of the classification module. This is the reason why you will have to upload that for that kind of processor. The system is illustrated here while running in real time. As soon as the data are available on the catalog on the size up or on the USGS website, they are downloaded to the local server. Once they are downloaded, they are pre-processed, atmospherically corrected, cloud screen, and turn into livery index in this case. This allow you to deliver leave area index map for the whole area of interest along the season. Of course, anomaly can be detected and heterogeneity of growing condition can be mapped. We can look at this in Southern Africa for some irrigated area where this color composition allow to see the crop type, same with the near infrared color composition, and then the time series of livery index. Recorded here on the 27th of October, and then on the mid-November, and then on the late November, then on the early December, late December, and finally the early January date before we get the harvest uh, and the end of the season in April. As you can see here, the heterogeneity of the growing condition would be assessed very nicely. For each pixel, you can derive a temporal profile of the LAI, allowing to derive some temporal metrics like the area under the curve, of the LAI maximum, which are metrics usually related to the crop yield. The system operation that we have been uh, running as illustrated before, can actually uh, be operating in two different modes. In near real time, using the orchestrator or on request. The automated mode, which is configured from the web graphical interface, will make use of the orchestrator to run automatically based on the by default parametrization. The download will be uh, checked every hour. The processing will be triggered based on the availability of a new image or of a new in-situ data set, which trigger the production of a crop type map, for instance. This is very much suited for operational production in near real time. Of course, this automated mode can be run also on user request whenever you want. Alternatively, the manual mode can run processor independently using custom job. The custom job allow you to define your own custom parameter and will run on its own uh, for a dedicated task as you have defined. You can see below the dashboard which allow to assess the resource use on your computer for the different processors. This is very important, of course, to make sure that 
you got enough storage, you got enough CPU, and you got enough memory. The in-situ data collection is very much required for the annual crop time mapping, as you know. Either you will be able to rely on available reference data set, typically collected according to an area or list sampling frame by the Ministry of Agriculture or by national statistical surveys. If no data is available, you will have to organize a field campaign, and this can be done according to the GCAM guidelines. Typically, a pragmatic approach will proceed with a windshield survey using motorized vehicle like the car, bonto bike, or even plane, which select a set of appropriate roads and a set of complementary roads to make sure that we will reduce the bias linked to the observation from the roads. Of course, roadside sampling is not the most randomly uh, secure sample, but this is a very pragmatic approach to cover very large area. The requirements for the in-situ data collection are as follows. They are very different according to the use of the data set. The reference ground information can be used for calibration. For calibration, you will need a sampling that cover the diversity of situation existing in the study area. The purpose is to cover the range of the possible signature for the different elements of interest. Typically, the crop type on all the main non cropland classes. Another use of the in situ dataset is the validation to estimate the product accuracy. To do so, you need to rely on a statistically sound sampling to be objective and independent. Of course, ideally, you will have to sample randomly through all the study area. However, for geologistic reasons, sampling completely random is not feasible. And we would rather prefer a two-stage sampling to assess the crop type at different scales. The two-stage sampling rely on primary sampling unit which can be villages, and those villages have to be randomly selected. And then you may have elementary sampling unit, which correspond to fields, which are randomly selected along the roads, as we mentioned it before, according to the GCAM guidelines. Combining the primary sampling unit and the elementary sampling unit will allow to set save a lot of time in transportation. Calibration and validation field campaign for crop time mapping can be combined. They are tedious and heavy operation. But if they are combined, then the sampling design should be statistically sound to obtain a fully independent data set, which is required for the validation. Once you got the in-situ data collected on the ground, we have to proceed with the quality control process and the dataset preparation. To build a high quality reference dataset collection, you need to have a reliable field campaign. For the non-crop area, you may rely on visual interpretation of very high spatial resolution imagery available online. Google Earth image, Bing image, allow you to identify the forest, the water, the urban area. While for the crop type, you have to go to the field. The quality control of this 
data set collected on the ground. We'll proceed with a geometric consistency check, a typology term standardization, and a homogeneity check. This may discard several polygons which were selected on the ground, but this is the only way to get a high reference quality data set. Then, according to the use of the data set, we have to split the polygon into calibration and validation. Typically, a quarter of the data set will be allocated to calibration and the rest to the validation. The split will take place at the polygon level and not at pixel level. In some cases, because of a poorly balanced in situ data set, we may have to require some alternative strategy, more complex, but already designed in the Sanforstat system. Last but not least, for the marginal crop type, which were not frequent in the data set collected on the ground, we need to enhance this sample using the synthetic minority oversampling technique. This is also part of the Sanforstat system for the in-situ dataset preparation. This dataset, serving as reference for validation, will allow to compute confusion matrix where we match the classification with regards to the reference data. This confusion matrix allows to compute four different metrics, which are as follows. The overall accuracy that you all know, corresponding to the diagonal of the element divided by the number of samples. The user accuracy, also called precision, corresponding to the fraction of the correctly classified pixel with regard to all pixels classified as this class in the classified image, and the producer accuracy corresponding to the fraction of correctly classified pixels with regard to all pixels on the ground through the class. The combination of precision and recall, or of user accuracy and producer accuracy, allow to compute a single matrix, which is very interesting for each class named F-score. The F-score is the harmonic mean of the precision and recall and will vary from one to zero, one being the best score. F-score is a very nice matrix because it is a synthetic matrix which refers to each class separately. Okay, let's run again the system in an automated mode to deliver in near real time a 10, met 10 meter crop type map at national scale. To do so, we will download the data from the Sentinel 2 app from the USGS Landsat web service and the Sentinel 1 signs app. All these data are pre processed as they arrive into the, the server, but then we have to upload the in-situ data as we proceed in the season. As soon as the in-situ data are uploaded, this triggers the production of a crop type map at the date of the, the delivery. A first crop type map, which could be what we call the mid-season crop type map, will be produced automatically. Of course, the season will continue and new acquisition will be acquired. Maybe new in-situ data will be also uploaded and will allow to proceed with a final crop type map at the end of the season. This final crop type map, of course, is expected to be better, providing better accuracy metrics. 
this is the way it could be running for large scale area and it has been running since 2016. Indeed, in 2016, the very first 10 meter national crop plan and crop time map based on Sentinel 2A only was delivered for Ukraine. The overall accuracy for the crop plan was 96%, while the overall accuracy for crop type was 81%. This allows to derive the proportion of the different crop for the different oblasts, the district area in Ukraine. Following our South Sudan example of the beginning of this session, we can look at the result and see how the mid-season cropland mask can perform compared to the end-season cropland mask. If you can see, the overall accuracy is rather similar. The F1 score non-cropland is similar, but the F1 score cropland is increasing significantly. This is expected as we got more data at the end of the season to discriminate the cropland from the non-cropland. We can also look at the result at the stratum level. As you remember, we subdivide the South Sudan in two zones corresponding to two calendars. And we see the same kind of result. The F1 score for the cropland area improve from the mid-season to the end of season, while the other metrics are rather similar. In Mali, the cloud free composite has been delivered from the Sentinel 2 uh, imagery on a monthly basis, as you can see here. And the data have been processed to deliver another cropland and another crop type, but only for the southern part of Mali in this case. This involves more than 4.5 terabytes of Sentinel 2 data corresponding to 2,152 Sentinel-2 images and 542 Landsat-8 images. The overall accuracy for the cropland are nice. The crop type map show an overall accuracy, which is rather poor, dot 66. Of course, we can visually also check the quality of the crop type map. And as you can see here, or even here, the pixel-based classification looks quite nice as we can dis distinguish the different pattern of uh, the field. Of course, this is not enough to be able to consider this as a good area estimate for the crop type. This data set, in fact, was produced with the precursor of Senforstat, which is the Sen2Agri system. Sen2Agri system is a precursor because it runs only from Sentinel-2 and Landsat-8, and it can deliver only these four kinds of product in a more basic way. However, this Sentinel-2 Agri system is available and can deliver on request or automatically uh, all these different products. Sen4Stat is a more complete and more operational solution for national processing and for local application to take advantage of Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 in addition to Landsat-8 and Landsat-9. Indeed, there is a state-of-the-art SAR processing toolbox which allows to provide high-level product that, like the coherence or the cross-ratio and many other uh, backscattering coefficients that I will illustrate right now. The Sen4Stat is, uh, is running uh, open source toolbox, 
which is uh, based on Orfeo, using the, the orchestrator in the slum uh, architecture and uh, using the SNAP toolbox, which is also introduced in the context of this training. The whole system runs on CentOS 7, which is the operating system, allowing to have a very reliable production line. The state of the art SAR, pro SAR processing correspond to this beta node, which are the slant range geometry of the backscattering coefficient, which is not used. Sigma node is the corrected uh, for the local incidence angle, and which is a common uh, backscattering coefficient. While in some area, we may need to run the gamma node correction, which flatten uh, using a digital elevation model. This gamma node is computer intensive, and therefore we will not apply this correction when it's not needed. The processor corresponding to the crop time mapping module is based on the random forest as a classifier by default. In addition, there is a deep learning alternative corresponding to a neuronal net uh, in the transformer uh, type. Specific quality control of in-situ data sets are applied for this crop type module to balance the calibration data set. And a set of features are used to discriminate the crop type. This is a large set which involves all the time series of the mission we mentioned, but also NDVI and then double UI, red edge indices, brightness time series, as well as polarization ratio time series. And in addition, a set of temporal metrics derived from the above time series and a set of Sentinel-1 temporal metrics derived from the SAR time series. This provides us a large set of features, giving more chance to discriminate difficult crop type. The random forest is probably the most well-known classifier, and I will not be very long on this, but for recall, this is based on decision trees. A decision tree is a recurs recursive partitions calibrated on training set to get regions which are increasingly, increasingly homogeneous with respect to the class. These define nodes and criteria to discriminate between the different classes. Building a large number of trees led to the random forest, which become an ensemble learning algorithm that combine multiple classification of the same data set to produce higher classification accuracies. The random forest proceed by bagging. Bagging will proceed with different subset of training data and subset of features, which allow to avoid the overfitting of the models. The bagging, bagging will build a large set of trees, and we will con conduct a single majority vote to identify the most frequent class decide from all the trees for a given pixel. This random forest will make use of the in-situ data to be able to build its model. This has been applied for 35 crop type in Spain, in the Spain area, where we got very similar accuracy from the random forest and the neuronal net transformer. The overall accuracy for 35 crop type is 80%, while when we cluster the crop according to their, their, their group, then we can reach up to 88%. 
Similarly, based on the existing national survey from the DAPSA in Senegal, a uh, random forest classification has been applied to Sentinel-2 and Landsat-8 M-series only to get the cropland area. The overall accuracy was 96% with a good F-score of 0.97 for the cropland. The non-cropland is less accurate and may require additional polygon to better define the different non-cropland classes. Using the same data set, but this time for the crop type map, we could find that we reach a very poor accuracy, 68%, probably because of the unbalanced ground observation data set. Indeed, as you can see in the confusion matrix, there is a, lo a lot of sample for the ground nuts. There is a lot of sample or other classes, while some other are very little sample. This unbalanced data set will not allow the random forest to build the appropriate trees to recognize the, all the different crop types. Therefore, we propose to proceed with a new specific in-situ data collection for a small area as a pilot experiment. In this case, we select randomly across the landscape the field to be visited as the area was limited. We have selected calibration data set, which are completely distinct and fully independent to the validation data set. You can look at the split. We have more calibration polygon than validation polygon because we have a small number of sample in total. This allows to pro process the cropland map and to reach a very good accuracy uh, with a F score of 0.98 for the cropland, and this time a F score for the non cropland to 95, which is much better than the one we got from the existing data set at the Senegal scale level. On the left side, you can see that the different tiles coming from the Sentinel-2 are never covering the area completely, while our area is still very small. This is to show that even for a small area like a department, the send for start system can be quite relevant to be able to make use of all these satellite missions. Using the data set for not only the crop plan, but also the crop time mapping, we can see the increase in the overall accuracy up to 84% thanks to much more balanced data set. You can have here the urban class in red, the forest in green, the water in blue, and the crop type according to the legend here. The groundnuts and the millet are very well classified with the F score reaching 0.91 or 84, which is very suitable for crop area estimate. While actually the maize still remain to a lower level, most probably because of the lack of in situ data. But we have to say that the lack of the in-situ data corresponds also to a very marginal situation of maize in this area. And therefore, the error here needs to be uh, interpreted in terms of importance with regard to the actual area of the crop in the landscape. All these results, I hope, illustrate how we can make use of the Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2, Landsat time series, thanks to the send for start system to deliver operational product for agriculture application. The intention of send for start is really the operational 
full-scale exploitation of this satellite mission to improve timely information delivery about crop area, as we have shown here, crop yield and crop production in, in, at the end. Of course, it will be very nice if National Statistical Office can make use of the system to take advantage of their national survey and improve their own statistic by using the Earth observation into their process. This is what is intended to be done in Senegal and other countries in the context of the Sun for Start project. This leads us to the section three, which will allow us to use practically the Sun for Start toolbox and to run your own crop time mapping. In this second part of the training, we would like to introduce the sun for stat toolbox. Of course, before getting access to the web interface of the sun for stat, you will have to run the installation package of sun for stat to install the system on your own computer or on any cloud, com com cloud computing infrastructure that you may access to. Once the installation package has been run successfully, you will have access to the send for start interface through the Explorer. Using the logging display, you can get in using the by default username, which is send for start, and the by default password, send for start. This allows you to connect for the first time while later on you will be able to define new users that who, to whom you want to get access to the system. Once you are logged in, you get into the site manager where you can create your site. Creating a new site means that you will define the area that you want to monitor for the agriculture season. This site can be run for many years or for once only. And the site here will be in Senegal, in Nioro more precisely, corresponding to a southern area of Senegal. To define precisely this area, you will have to upload a shapefile in a zip format, which allow you to exactly ingest the definition of your site. Once the site has been created, you are invited to edit it to define the mission you want to use for the, the, the satellite data. By default, there will be the Sentinel-2 data, but you can also select Landsat 8 and 9, as well as Sentinel-1 to make sure that you will get data even with uh, the occurrence of frequent cloud coverage. You can see that your site or your area of interest correspond to the two tiles for Sentinel-2 and for five scenes for Landsat-8. Once you have the area and the mission selected, you can define the season that you want to process. But of course, before defining the season, you have to determine what kind of product you want to deliver. The product we want to deliver here is a crop type, and this is the reason why we select the S4S crop mapping. There are many processors that can be activated, as you can see here, but also some of them are activated by default as they correspond to the pre-processing of the Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 imagery, as well as cloud screening and other information like this. Of course, you have also to define the season you want to look at, and you got to give a name and a starting date corresponding to the beginning of the season of agriculture 
production you want to monitor and map. We will select the 1st of May, then we can select a mid-season date, which corresponds to the timing when we can hope to get an early crop type map. And we will select the 1st of July, because at that time, several crop types can be already discriminated uh, in this area. Most importantly, is the final date, which corresponds to the end of the season, and we will select the 31st of December, corresponding to the date of the delivery of the crop type map, the final crop type map. These seasons need to be enabled, meaning that it will be running once we will have saved the season and configure all the remaining parameters. We will save the season into the site, and you can see here in the display that the site Senegal Neuro has been uh, allocated with one season and one period starting from the 1st of May to the 31st of uh, December. Now we need to find where to get the input data, the satellite data. By using the Data Sources Manager, we can select different source and data up from where we will use the satellite mission data. There are two ways. Either you are on the cloud infrastructure where you have already in storage the mission corresponding to the selection you made, and therefore you will have to select this uh, source and you will not have to download the data, you will just get access to the data which are already stored in the cloud infrastructure. This will be the most efficient way to run the system, and this is why Senforstat is very much dedicated to run on cloud infrastructure. As you will see, the processing of a growing season for a large area require a lot of product and therefore being close to the data storage is a major advantage. Alternatively, if you don't get access to a cloud infrastructure and you are running on your own server, then you will need to download the data from different data app. And here you can select, for instance, several data app. You can run from the, Sent the Sentinel-2 scientific data app of ESA if you want, but this will work only if you run in near real time, because ESA is a rolling archive which is very short, and you will have to download the data as they are acquired along the season. If you are not in such a timing, then it's probably safer to get your data from a data hub which store the data for long like the Luxembourg Space Agency Data Center, where you can query the data even from previous years. Before you get access to such a download, you will have to create your own account on the Luxembourg Space Agency Data Center, get your credential that you can input here to make sure that the Stanford system will get authorized to download the data from the Luxembourg Space Agency Data Center. You have to enable this, of course, and there you will get the Sentinel-2 download uh, available for the corresponding period. Next to the Sentinel-2, you want to select Landsat 8 uh, from the USGS uh, Data Center, and you can enable as well this download using your own credential from this uh, Landsat 8 USGS web service. Last but not least, to get Sentinel-1 data involved in your crop mapping, you have to also download the Sentinel-1 data, and we propose to use the same, in this case, using the same credential from the Luxembourg Space Agency Data Center. This means that now we have been connecting from, to the different source of data that we want to use for the crop type mapping for our season. Once we have uh, done that, we need to activate the site, and therefore 
we can select the on button to activate the site, which starts actually the download uh, of the data. This is very important to start the download and the pre-processing of the data as soon as you know that you want to monitor a growing season, because this is a huge amount of data, a lot of download, a lot of pre-processing, and of course, earlier we, you will be able to do it, to do it, earlier you will be able to deliver your final product. The pre-processing can run from the send to core uh, L2A uh, data for Sentinel-2, but you can also select other alternatives for the atmospheric correction and the cloud screening, like the Maya or the F-mask algorithm. By uh, launch, launching this download, you can see that in, from the system overview uh, interface, you can see the activity on your CPU, where you see the, the query starting for your area of interest for the mission that you have selected. Of course, this will take quite a bit of time and will require to download a lot of data. This is starting now, and once we have uh, select the right uh, the, the right uh, data sources, all the data will be coming down. You get here the statistics, and the statistic in green show the number of products which has been already downloaded. In blue, the ongoing one, while in red are the failed one, and in orange are the unsuccessful one, which need to be repeated uh, later on. It is important to know that the system will check every hour if there is any other new data which can be used for your crop mapping, meaning that for the three source, for the three data up, the system will check every hour if there is any new data to download. As we have done this, of course, it will take a long time to get all the data available. And this is the reason why we propose to show you how this works when you go to a, a, a site which has been already processed, like the Senegal 2021, where you see that for the same area of interest, you have 250 products which has been successfully downloaded and no failure and no remaining uh, data product to be downloaded. This allows us, of course, to check the statistic in detail and see when these products uh, have been acquired by the satellite and if we got the right processing for all these. In blue, you see the acquisition. In green, you see the process and the successful process of these available data. You can do that for Sentinel-1, for Sentinel-2, we can have a look at this product visually by going to the product tab where we can select the surface reflectance product which has been atmospherically corrected and therefore you see each by one here there is 140 uh, product corresponding to the area of interest. You see here a, a natural color composite that you can download from the, from the system but of course, there are so many that you don't intend to download them. You want to process them where they are. This is for the Sentinel-2. We can have a look for the Sentinel-1 to make sure that the amplitude product has been also properly pre-processed and uh, are available for our crop type mapping production. This is the case. And this concludes the first step of the preparation of the system. It's first time meaning that we have defined the area, we have defined the period, and we have defined the satellite mission we want to use, as well as the data source from where we will download the data. This allows us to move to the second part of the work, which corresponds to the production of crop type mapping. 
This is what we call a processor in the context of Stat, and the processor need to be configured uh, for the, the, the production. You see that there are many processors, but today we focus only on the crop type mapping using the random forest. Random forest, as you know, is a machine learning algorithm. There will be many more available, including deep learning algorithm very soon. But right now, the random forest correspond to the OTB random forest implementation, which is also open source, and where we can define a large number of parameters. We can define the depth of the random forest trees, we can define the number of trees. But in addition, we want also to make sure that the in-situ data that we will be using are representative. And this is why there are a, a significant number of parameters corresponding of the, to the minimum number of pixels required for a polygon to be used for calibration, the minimum pixel to be used for validation, and the minimum uh, share between calibration and validation according to the availability of in-situ data for each crop type. These define different strategies that we can select and fine tune here. The default parameter will provide you a, a, a proper uh, output and therefore we propose to use it as it is. Once we have configured the random forest, we will, of course, have to import some in-situ data. As you know, crop time mapping requires a field data collection to make the link between the location and the crop type. This corresponds to polygons that has been observed on the ground and that we can display here in the QGIS or any GIS software where we can assess the geometry and the type of crop type for each of these polygons. In this case, we have a field with millet and we have another field with maize and we can make sure that we cover the range of the diversity of the crop type in the area. In addition to the crop type, we need to add non-crop land, land cover type polygon to make sure that the random forest will make the difference between the crop type and the, the other land cover that are not of interest for us. As the uh, in-situ data seems compatible with our production, we want to import them into the Sanforstat system. To do so, we go back into the season we want to process and uh, we have the button upload file where we can upload the in-situ uh, this will be a shape file in a zip format allowing to ingest large amount of data uh, into the system we upload it and this is made available to the processor for crop type mapping to make sure that this is properly done we can go to the product to display this in-situ data into the viewer uh, and make sure that this import has been properly and successfully completed. This is uh, confirmed, we can see that, and therefore this allows us to start the, the processing. But first the system will do some quality control of the in-situ data on its own and will also make a buffer of one pixel around the boundaries to make sure that we use only pure pixel for the calibration. Similarly, this in-situ data will be split into uh, calibration and validation data set at the polygon level to make sure that they are fully independent for the calibration. This will require also to use some metrics uh, for the random forest and a large set of metrics will be uh, used, not only the reflectance of Sentinel-2, the, re the backscattering coefficient of Sentinel-1, and of course the reflectance of Landsat, 
but as well NDVI time series, brightness time series, NDWI time series, and additional temporal matrix like monthly composite of backscattering coefficient and many others, all being ingested for the random forest. Of course, we need, as I explained earlier in the training, to balance the in-situ data accordingly to make sure that we will not mislead it, the random forest. Once this has been uh, in place, we can expect that the production of the crop type map has been completed. And this is the case, as you can see here, the product is available here and can be downloaded from this web interface. Of course, the download will allow you to get access to the uh, product, the crop type map, but also will provide you some accuracy metrics like the F1 score and the overall accuracy based on the validation data set. In this case, we will not download the data. We will first have a look using the viewer in the send for start uh, system. And this viewer allows us to zoom in and to see the different crop type in millet, the millet in yellow, the groundnuts in pink, and the maize in orange. Of course, the urban area are in red and the forest in, in green. This looks like a reasonable product and quite interesting. Even we see the shape of the parcels while it is a pixel-based classification. But maybe you, you would like to give a try to improve this product. To do so, you can go back to the Synforstat system and using the same metrics, the same feature, the same in-situ data, you can use a custom job tab to select the crop mapping again for your site and define maybe another run without Landsat 8, without Sentinel-1, and uh, for maybe a season which will be a bit shorter. For instance, we can still start from the 1st of May, but maybe stop on the 31st, 30 of November to make sure that we don't cover the season of fire in Senegal. We will select all the corresponding images, and this allows us to run with the same random forest parameter, a new job that we submit right now and will be running right away. Of course, this will produce a new crop type map that I will need to call the previous one to see which one is the most performant one. We, I can compare also the metrics, the accuracy metrics, to see how much we discriminate the different crop type according to the different approaches. This crop type mapping processor is only one among many in the Sanforstat system, which has been designed not only for mapping, but also for monitoring. And therefore, what we just explained for crop time mapping can be extended for monitoring. For instance, we can produce cloud-free color composite using the same data set for a specific period uh, that uh, I can select from 10 days to uh, 50 days if I want. And I can select a lot of advanced parameters to play according to the area of interest, depending of aerosol optical thickness, the frequency of these aerosol in my area, I can tune my compositing algorithm accordingly. This is to produce image mainly for the purpose of visualization. For crop monitoring, what is most interesting is the vegetation status processor which provide us the opportunity to produce time series of a lot of biophysical variables like FAPAR, F-cover, leaf area index, and so on. Those will be made available on a regularly regular time step over the season and allow me to see the growing and the crop development uh, along the season for the different crop type. This 
conclude the introduction of the Senforstat interface. As you fully understood, this is a system which has been designed to run over large area. As you don't have to handle file by file, the system will, based on your shape file, define the area of interest and the corresponding product for the different mission you have select and automatically, automatically download them for your own purpose. Similarly, the processor, meaning the, the product, will be produced in near real time automatically as the data are acquired if you run in near real time or as you launch the processor if you want to do uh, the job in a customized way. Thank you, Pierre, for the amazing overview on large-scale crop mapping using the SEND for STAT toolbox. I hope everyone participating in today's training found the practical with the SEND for STAT toolbox a value for their own area of interest. There are so many great products generated from the Send for Stat toolbox, and the interface seems very user-friendly. Thank you again, Pierre, for such a thorough presentation. Next week, we'll be joined once more by Dr. Pierre de Fourny from UC Louvain, as well as Fabrizio Ramuino from CERCO to present on crop-specific time series analysis for growth monitoring. They will be demonstrating how to retrieve crop-specific leaf area indice index time series from Sentinel-2 using SNAP, as well as a time series analysis of crop types and anomalies detection and intraparcel heterogeneity assessment for different agricultural fields using optical data with Python Jupyter Notebooks. We hope you will join us for this fourth and final part of the webinar series next Tuesday. Below is the contact information for Dr. DeForney, along with links to the training webpage and ESA's EO for Society website. Below are links to access the different toolboxes and applications presented in today's training, along with links to two other agricultural trainings led by Dr. DeForney. This slide provides instructions for the Send for Stat installation package, which will, be, which will be made available in June of this year. As a reminder, there will be one homework assignment for all four parts of the training. Answers must be submitted via Google Form, which can be accessed from the training page on the RSET website. Homework will be made available on May 3rd with a due date of May 17th. A certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all live webinars and complete the homework assignment by the deadline. You will receive a certificate approximately two months after the completion of the course from Marinas Martin. We will now transition to the question and answer session of today's training. Please answer your question in the question and answer box and we will get to them in the order they were received. Thank you. Wonderful, and we've been getting some really good questions coming in throughout the, today's webinar, and we do encourage if you have a question, please do submit it, and we will get to it uh, momentarily. So question number one, are some send for stat processes and products able to be replicated in Google Earth Engine? And Pierre, if you wanted to unmute and answer, that would be fantastic. Thank you, Shin, for this introduction. So send for stat, has been designed to run automatically and continuously. And therefore, this is very dedicated to run on any cloud computing infrastructure, providing the fact that you get access to Sentinel-1 SLC and Sentinel-2 L2A or L1C data. Google Earth Engine could replicate the, the some of the processing or workflow, but mostly 
those regarding the Sentinel-2 exploitation, because Google Earth Engine does not provide Sentinel-1 SLC time series. Wonderful, thank you. Question number two, is polarimetry good for distinguishing or classifying uh, one, salinity in soil using the C or L bands, two, subsoil water using L band, or three, soil versus snow versus glacial ice? Thank you for this question, which is referring to the previous uh, part of the training and which not, was not addressed today. I'm not the best expert in polarimetry for sure. Uh, what I can mention is the fact that the SAR signal are obviously sensitive to dielectric properties and therefore potentially sensitive to salinity and subsoil water content because they modify the electrical conductivity of the materials. However, uh, this is not clear how much this influence the backscattering coefficient and its intensity. And furthermore, I would say that this is less sensitive to polarimetry than uh, to signal amplitude or intensity. Wonderful, thank you, Pierre. Question number three, does the send for stat toolbox extend to other applications like deforestation and forest degradation mapping on a large scale? Thank you. As you fully understood, the send for stat is able to process very large scale area meaning that the processing workflow could apply to other kind of classification of Earth observation. And typically, land cover mapping can be run as long as you introduce the appropriate in-situ dataset. Uh, this has been done typically in the Philippines. Uh, however, for forest degradation or forest uh, deforestation, sorry, uh, this may require very specific in situ data set uh, to be able to train uh, the supervised random forest classifier in an appropriate way. Thank you, Pierre. Question number four. When will send for stat be available to download? As already mentioned, send for stat will be released officially by early July 2022, could be possibly by late June. The system is already developed, but in a beta version and currently tested for demonstration cases. Meanwhile, if you want to start uh, even from tomorrow or today, you can download the Send to Agri system, which is uh, dedicated to optical time series only, Sentinel-2 dataset, and would allow you to do most of the Send for Start uh, application related to crop time mapping and LAI uh, time series analysis and so on. And even you can use the send for cap system, which is an object based oriented uh, processing system, which are also available uh, since several years. And both are regularly updated. These are open source toolbox, which are actually the predecessor of the send for stack. Wonderful. Yeah, it's great to hear that in two to three months, uh, send for stat will be released to the public. So for all the participants, we do hope that you will check back at the website that, that, uh, that Pierre has provided for you all. Uh, question number five, in a lot of developing countries, the field data is not available, but the area statistics are available. Is there any way to perform an unsupervised classification to determine areas and then back out crop type based on the area? Thank you for this good idea. As you mentioned, this is fully right that uh, the area statistics are available, but they will be only usable if we are uh, looking at a very simple agricultural landscape, typically showing one, two, or three largely, largely dominant crops. If they are very significantly different, therefore, unsupervised classification will be able to, to provide cluster corresponding to this crop probably. However, there is no guarantee to capture these rep respective crop signature. Therefore, this is still not the recommended, recommended pathway to get in-situ data. 
Great. And this next question six looks like it refers to one of the case studies that was provided in your presentation. So right. is the field data for South Sudan publicly available? Uh, unfortunately, the, I'm not able to answer this question for good. The World Food Program own this data and they may be willing to share them, but uh, I cannot answer that for, for them. Wonderful. Question seven. You mentioned temporal metrics of SAR time series. Can you give some examples and explain this further? Sure. The send for stat include a set of SAR temporal metrics, which are, as you fully understood, derived from the SAR time series. And those are typically the monthly mean composite or the annual standard deviation of the full SAR time series. And this can be computed and is computed for the different polarization and for the different mode, the ascending and the descending mode. Therefore, providing different temporal metrics for each of these. Great. Question number eight. Can you explain send for stat ID and pass? Yeah. As soon as you will install the, the send for stat, there is a default user account which allow you to connect for the first time. The username is sent for start and the password is sent for start. Once you run the system, you will be able to configure to configure new username and of course to delete the by default one if you want. Therefore, you, there is an initial one, an initial one to start with. And question number nine, where can we get the installation packet for send for stat? I couldn't find it at the link that was provided. Yeah, the reason was explained earlier. Uh, the, the, the package will be released officially by late June or early July 2022. And this is the reason why you won't be able to find the installation package right now. As you have seen at the end of the, the presentation, there is a slide with the instruction for installation, which has been already provided, but the installation package is not available yet. But as mentioned before, other systems are already available and can be used and uh, are actually quite valuable to get trained to, to be ready for some foster. And question number 10, what methods were used in collection of field data? Uh, we have select the GCAM recommendation. You can find the link in the, in the document, uh, which is defined actually a pragmatic approach for in-situ data collection. Of course, there may be other strategy to collect in-situ data, but uh, this recommendation was found very helpful in many countries. Wonderful. And uh, I believe that someone will be posting that in the chat so everybody has access to that link. Uh, so question number 11, on the RSET description page, this workshop said it would also include national statistical data sets and surveys for agricultural statistics. How are those incorporated? You are right. Uh, as you have seen the example for Senegal, this has been run by uh, the DAPSA, which is the National Official Statistical Office, providing the data they have been collecting uh, during their annual survey. This data has been incorporated as in-situ data. And this is the reason why during the training we explained that their in-situ data was not well balanced and we complete another Institute situ data campaign with them using their own enumerators or surveyors, and they provide us the new Institute data. Uh, therefore, this allows us to do some crop type mapping, as you have seen, and the intention is to improve the agriculture statistic by improving the cost efficiency, the spatial disaggregation, and the timeliness of the delivery of information. But you are right that all these very specific topics has not been fully addressed in this uh, context. 
but uh, if needed, we can provide more information about that. Wonderful. And question 12, can we export different products generated using Send for Stack? Yes, of course. There is a, a, a button where you can just download the final product direct, directly from the web interface, which has been demonstrated, and the product will be accessible uh, directly. Uh, they can be also accessed through a Linux terminal if you want. Uh, this is another way to do it. Great, and question 13. Can the Send for Stat platform be used to monitor the conditions of mangrove vegetation? I would say so, as the platform allow you to process vegetation indices and biophysical variables, you will be able to actually derive uh, the, the time series on a very regular time, time step uh, to monitor the, the, let's say the dynamic or the phenological uh, feature of the mangrove. Okay, great. And question 14, how can we assess crop fields having two crop types for the same study period? That's a very nice question. Uh, indeed, in many countries, we refer to mixed crop or associated crops, uh, meaning that two different crops have, have been sown at the same time over the same area. In such a situation, of course, you cannot label the field according to one or the other crop. The only way to proceed is actually to label this field by the mixed cropping of the two crops, meaning beans and corn. Therefore, it will be a new class corresponding to this mixed crop uh, area. There is a, a challenge there because in some cases, only one of the crop will be developed and the other one will be actually surely, I mean, largely underdeveloped. Therefore, the in situ observation is very important to associate some information about the dominance of one or on, of the other crops. And a truly mixed crop will combine both, I would say, at the rather same level, or at least being both uh, largely present over the field. Therefore, the recommendation is to add a new crop type corresponding to the mixed crop and different mixing can exist meaning addition i mean several additional crops need to be uh, listed in, in the in the typology wonderful uh thank you pierre question 15 how do you transfer learning uh for random forest and use it in another area and can you also provide any information on crop classification using harmonic time series? Transfer learning is really a, a key research topic. And in our field of agriculture monitoring, I have to say that I have not read a lot of successful application of transfer learner, learning, neither from one year to another, nor from one area to another. Of course, if you are processing a small area and then you can transfer your model to the next, I mean, to, to the area next to the one you, you used for calibration, this would be a successful transfer learning. But actually, when it comes to using a, a, a model which has been calibrated for a given large region to another one, which could be significantly separate, we can say that today the science is not complete, the research sign, I mean, the research is not complete to propose, a, let's say, a generic solution. This is a very active research uh, activity, and uh, I hope that we will be uh, able to provide some solution in the coming years. But this is a drawback of the, let's say the machine learning and the artificial intelligence uh, methods today. Uh, 
Now, with the harmonic time series, uh, this can be, uh, yeah, we can use some uh, harmonic analysis of the time series. Uh, today, we did not find this as a very powerful solution in our cases. Great, and question 16, will we be able to install send for stat in uh, Ubuntu? Send for cap accepts uh, the CentOS 7 only, which makes it difficult to operate. Uh, send for stat is unfortunately running only on CentOS 7, and there is a reason for that. CentOS 7 is very stable, and as send for stat is designed to be fully operational, we don't want to have any bugs or any uh, instability in, in that kind of processing chain as it runs on its own. And this is a reason why CentOS 7 has been uh, selected and uh, still used uh, for that kind of, well, let's say, uh, uh, large scale processing uh, system. Uh, if someone wants to transfer this to some other environment, they are most welcome, of course. Wonderful. Thank you, Pierre. Question 17. Do you need the crop type before estimating biophysical variables or at least improve the accuracy of the estimates? This is a, a very nice question as well. Thank you. Uh, you don't need the crop type to derive the biophysical variables because uh, the biophysical variables retrieval is based on the radiative transfer model, which will be explained in the next part of this training, part four. And as you will see, actually, this can be very generic and applicable to any crop type. We did complete some research by focusing on a specific crop type to improve the estimate of the biophysical variables like the Green Liver Index but the improvement were, were only very, very uh, little and did, I mean, was not necessary uh, useful for, for the application, uh, uh, for large scale application. Therefore, this, is, this could improve very slightly your estimate, but this was not proved to be uh, efficient and uh, let's say uh, scalable. Great. Question 18. Is it possible to classify fruit tree types and or olive trees? Yes, there is even a specific processor in the St. Forstat system fully dedicated to permanent crop type. And this is available in the St. Forstat. While in the St. To agree, the permanent crop or perennial crop was processed as the others, as any crop type. In this and for start system, there is a dedicated processor for that, a specific processor. Great. Uh, question 19. Can we measure soil parameters such as soil moisture content, soil texture, organic matter, pH, salt and lime contents using SEN for stat? Uh, this would be wonderful. Eh? <laughs> Unfortunately, SEN for stat is only running based on Earth's observation from satellite. And therefore, except the soil moisture content, which can be estimated from the Sentinel-1 time series when the vegetation attenuation is not too strong, uh, we don't see how we could uh, infer the soil texture on organic matter or the pH, the salt and the lime content using satellite imagery. Carbon organic matter could, in some case, be assessed, but this is not part of the same for stat. Wonderful. And question 20. Can the send for stat app be installed on the Windows operating system, or can it only work with Linux? Unfortunately, send for stat can only work with Linux. For the same reason that we mentioned before, for stability reason, reason, and to be able to be, I mean, to not depend to any upgrade or update of operating system. 
And question 21, is there a method or software to geocode the phase image of some other type SAR? Uh, this is not part of the send for start. Uh, send for start deal only with the Sentinel-1 imagery to derive the interferometric coherence. Uh, for the phase, I would recommend to use the SNAP, uh, which should be able to run the Radarsat imagery, as far as I remember. Uh, but uh, I'm not aware about any other open source software. There are commercial software, of course, uh, that I may not mention here, uh, except if you allow me. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, well, Dr. DeForney, I believe we have gotten through all the questions as we are wrapping up today's, uh, today's training. And be mindful of every, all the participants that we do have one more training in this webinar series that will take place next Tuesday. So we do hope you all join us for that final part of this webinar series. But uh, Dr. DeForme, I did want to hand it over to you and ask you if you had any last comments or, or reflections that you wanted to share with today's participants. Uh, I thank you for your attention and for your very nice uh, question and the lively interaction. I would recommend for those who are eager to start right away with in-situ data and uh, send to agree system to go to the geo knowledge hub uh, the geo is the organization of the space agency on the geo knowledge hub you will find a full set of materials combining in situ data earth observation data and the software to download including the installation package which allow you to start with right away while you may wait for the send for start release which is coming soon and which should be a, a breakthrough because of the combination of sentinel-1 and sentinel-2 uh, processing workflow over a very large scale in the real time thank you for your attention and we look forward to see you next week Dr. DeForney, thank you so much, as well to all the colleagues also from UC Levin that were uh, assisting today with answering the questions. Thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, wonderful presentation, and again, we do hope you'll join us all next week for the uh, final fourth part of this webinar series. Uh, big thanks to the entire RSET team for uh, providing support and, and running this webinar series. So once again, for all the participants that joined us today, thank you, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Goodbye.